contradiction. Nothing personal. Word of the day. Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Final show of the trip. Coca, the nothing personal road trip is coming to an end. As I get on a plane, I feel like driving again. I miss it. But alas, it's time to get to back to the background that you're used to on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. It's time to back to wearing a blazer and a shirt back in the regular studio. Contradiction. Word of the day chosen. You know, I've had so many problems with athletes over the years with contradictory statements. We say one thing, the player says another. We end up having to call the agent, talk to the agent about why the player is saying what he said publicly. The agent calls us. Why are you saying what you said publicly? It happens mostly with injuries. And I'm not talking about HIPAA violations. I'm talking about injuries where we're explaining, yes, the player needs some rest or we're going to hold out the player. Or we didn't pinch hit that player in that situation because we thought the best matchup was someone else. And then the players asked by the media after the game, and the player says, I was ready. Happens with pitchers. I didn't want to come out of the game. You'll have to ask the manager. I wanted to be in the game. I told him I wanted to stay in the game. Contradiction comes when you go to the mound, ask for the ball. Hey, you got another hitter in you. Hey, I'm good. Pitchers always say the same thing. I got another one. With all the managers that I've had, I've spoken to every single one of them. There's not one manager who ever told me that he's ever gone to the mound to ask the pitcher, hey, how you feeling? Can you give me one more? Not one time does a pitcher say, ah, no, nope, I'm good. No more. No mas. Can't do it. So that means the manager has to decide. Do you know managers already know what they're going to do with their pitching change when they walk out to the mound, even when they don't make a hand gesture? Yet. They don't want to show up the pitcher. They want to pretend they're giving the pitcher an idea because if a pitcher says, I'm in, I'm good, then the manager says, yeah, you've been great, but let's go ahead and make this move. And then after the game, we'll talk to the pitcher. The media will. Sometimes the pitcher will say something not good. Sometimes the pitcher will say, you know, I really don't feel it. Or a hitter will say, yeah, you know, I'm 0 for 20 against their closer, but I, I want to be in there. Don't pinch hit for me. And we'll say, yeah, you're being pinch hit for. And then at the end of the game, the hitter will say to the media, I was ready. I respect the decision of the manager, but obviously I was ready. Well, you're aware you're over 20. Yes, of course I'm aware, but doesn't that mean the odds are with me? Contradictions happen a lot. And the reason why they're reported on is it indicates some sort of dysfunction in the organization. Dysfunction is what makes the media go round. They're looking for issues, right? They're looking to see after the Machado slide the other day on Tommy Pham. Did you see that slide? They're looking to see. We'll talk about it later. They're looking to see how angry is Manny? How angry is Tommy? Is there bad blood? Let's go get Dustin Pedroia to talk about this, who Machado slid into and basically ended his career. So the media every day has to come up with these stories. And the Pujol story has just been perfect for media conversations and articles being written about everywhere, every one of your websites, even in the AP, non-sports websites, has articles about what happened with Pujols leaving California and joining California. We obviously don't need to talk about what we talked about yesterday, but today, something new happened. Albert Pujols finally spoke, and what he said was very concerning if you are Joe Madden. Very concerning if you are Artie Moreno. Very concerning if you are Dan Lozano. Dan Lozano is Pujols' agent. Pujols, when asked, he put on a Dodgers uniform. He looked good in it, by the way. Pujols looks good in any uniform. He's 40-whatever years old, and he's fit. Looks great. He said, my goal over the last two years, it was never to try to be an everyday first baseman. Not true. He's tried. He just hasn't been able to be. I told you guys early in spring training, whatever role they have for me, I'm going to go with. I understand they made that decision as an organization, a business decision. No hard feelings. I understand that. They had a talk with me and that was it. Move forward. I'm just glad to get another opportunity to wear a different uniform. Holy shnikes. 
the entire time the Angels have been saying to you that Albert Pujols wanted to be a full-time player. And I took them at their word because I could absolutely picture Albert Pujols having that sort of pride when you're that level Hall of Famer where you don't want to end your career as a bench player. Many players do not. They want to either start or they just want to be done. Very few people coast off into the sunset when you're a Hall of Famer. It happens, but not often. But why would the Angels proffer an explanation as to why they designated him for assignment? Talk about the fact that there was a disagreement over his playing time and we were very honest with him. And then we both thought it was in our best interest collectively to move on. Why would Albert Pujols have it in his collective best interest to move on if he's playing the role with the Angels that he's happy to play with anyone else? Why would the Angels get torched in the media with the way they treated him, with the way all these other players have said how disrespectful it was. You didn't give him a chance to say goodbye. Mike Trout was crying, yada, yada, yada. Why would the Angels make that up? You know what the Angels could have done? They could have just taken the microphone and said, we're designating Albert Pujols for assignment. We love him. We thank him. We felt it was time to move on. You leave it at that. Why would you lie? In all the press conferences I've done about player moves, the reason why you don't lie is if there's an actual, actual version of events that is indisputable with witnesses, you can't lie about it because you're just going to get caught. And as an organization, if you get caught during this sort of PR situation with Pujols, if you get caught lying, no one's going to take your side. And PR is all about getting more people on your side than the other side. Okay. So Pujols meets the media. The Angels should have had nothing to worry about. All you expect him to say is, I changed my mind. When I had a chance to stay home, I changed my mind. But that's not what Pujols said. So then I looked to see what Andrew Friedman said because did the Dodgers promise him a Rose Garden? Did the Dodgers promise him that he would be a full-time first baseman because of all the injuries that have taken place? And once Corey Seager broke his hand, did they say, yeah, we're going to move Muncie over to second base, Taylor over to third, that leaves first base open, you're playing first base, and you're going to hit cleanup every day, you're in, we want you. I know Andrew Friedman. There is zero chance that that's what Andrew Friedman said to Albert Pujols. Andrew Friedman gave a quote yesterday that makes perfect sense to me. We have a lot of young players up right now, guys that we like and feel will be productive major leaguers. At this point, they haven't really seized that opportunity, and it's only been sporadic playing time. We're trying to figure out how to augment our bench, our lineup, our defensive configuration at every turn. That's a professionally seasoned, workshopped, veteran. Do you know what he's saying when Albert Pujol shows that to his agent? Hey, what does he mean by that exactly? Because last night I hit in the cleanup and started in first base. Am I there now every day? This is exactly what they told me. This is exactly what they told me not to expect, but now I'm doing it. Now I read his quotes. So now maybe I think I am playing every day, which makes it right that I did it. So then I can go back and say, I did say that to the angels. Or was that a one-game thing because of these injuries and when Seager comes back or against a right-handed pitcher, it's not going to be me. I'm a platoon player maybe or a bench player. What do I take from this Andrew Friedman quote? Albert thinks to himself. So I'm going to translate it for Albert. It's pretty clear. What you're supposed to be, Albert, is a veteran presence on the bench. You're supposed to help all of the players on the team because they all know that you have won a championship, even though many of the Dodgers did, and they're trying to repeat. And you're supposed to be a complimentary piece, not a middle-of-the-lineup guy who's playing every day. A complimentary piece. We're going to see how it goes. But if everyone's healthy and everyone starts performing the way they're supposed to perform, that would leave you as the odd man out and likely off the playoff roster, which is why Samson had the way to see yesterday that you're not going to be on the playoff roster, assuming health and performance of 25 players greater than yours. Now, if Albert Pujols hits cleanup and plays first base and starts hitting 275 and does the equivalent of 25 home runs and 95 RBI as a productive player, then of course he's going to make the playoff roster. 
But if the Angels thought that that was even a possibility, given where the Angels are, they're not trying to get Walsh more playing time, which is their claim. They're trying to win games. They're trying to put the best players out there to win games because they've got one of the best players in the league in Shohei Otani and Mike Trout, and they're not winning games. So the Pujols situation continues to be a mess, and it was made worse by Pujols' quotes, by Friedman's quotes, because now we don't know squat about squat. The only thing that will tell is time. Okay, it's enough about him for a while, right? I think it is. Let's see him play. I watched. Looks good. It's not that it looks bad in Dodger Blue. It just looks weird. All right, something happened yesterday that hurt me uh, because it happens too often. It should never happen. And I want to tell you how we... First, first we should read the question, Coca. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. That's when you get in Twitter at David P. Samson. Ask a question in my DMs. We try to get to it on the show. You hit download. You hit follow on Nothing Personal's page. You rate and review. You just engage in Nothing Personal. You buy Nothing Personal shirts and sweatshirts, even though they're not for sale yet. I'm still working on that, folks. Come on, CBS. We're, work with me while you can. Come on. In any case, so you want to talk to Samson's from the movie Half Baked. If you're new to nothing personal, Half-Baked is a movie where there's a character named Samson and people want to talk to him. And what they want to talk about in that movie is getting some weed. In this movie, it's getting some answers. And when there's good questions, I'll try to answer them on Twitter or in the show. Question today. Would you try to discipline Wesker Yinoya? 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 Yinoya. <laughs> the pitcher for the Braves. If you were in charge of the Braves. Now, what am I talking about? There's a pitcher for the Braves. We're going to call him Yinoya. Yinoa. I call him Yinoa. Coco wants me to say Yinoya, but I'm going more smoothly. Yinoa. He did something yesterday that is a real problem for me. He had a bad start. That's not the real problem for me. Do you know, pitchers, you can win the ERA title and you can have over, if you start 30 games, you can actually give up five runs and three innings and still win the Cy Young and win the ERA title. And you can do that more than once in a season. Bad starts happen. There, even Hall of Famers have bad starts. To be a Hall of Fame pitcher, to be a productive Major League pitcher or a productive Major League Baseball player, there is something that we look for other than arm strength, other than the five tools, hitting, pitching, fielding, throwing, we are looking for this tool. Are you looking on, the, on YouTube? If you're not, I'm touching my temple. We're looking to see what's between the ears. And I don't need you to tell me about the Israeli-Palestine conflict. That's not going to be on the test. I'm not asking you to tell me how teams get financed, how A-Rod bought the Wolves, what that financing plan looks like. Not interested in that. Not that you're not capable. It just doesn't interest me whether you know it. It's not that they're not important subjects. It doesn't interest me whether you know it. What interests me is how you, one, deal with failure because baseball is a game of failure. How are you going to deal with it? We've talked about that when you bring up an, a star player, Jared Kelenic from uh, the Seattle Mariners. Remember, he had a home run game, too. He got three hits, and every said, everyone said, that's it. It's done. He's the, That's it. The greatest rookie ever. I'm checking right now, Coca, and I believe that Kelnick is now hitting 190 after a few games. Is that possible, Coca? Somewhere in the 190 range. And you know what my view is of that? No problem. Because I'm watching him play, and he looks. The Mariners lost 4-1 to one yesterday. The Mariners are back to 500. Kelnick went one for four. He's hitting 182. And Kelnick's been hitting leadoff since he was brought up. When you commit to a player, you commit to a player to play, and you see how they react to their first slump. I wouldn't say, by the way, Kelnick's not in a slump right now. Even starting four for 22 for a career does not a slump make. Remember the amount of pressure he has. So, but we're looking their body language. Are they throwing their helmet? Are they snapping their bats? We're looking at stuff like that. When it's a pitcher, we're looking at what the pitcher does when he's taken out of the game after a bad start. We're looking at how the pitcher gets impacted in his preparation for his next start. 
Does he get lazier? Does he start throwing his bullpens harder, not softer? Does he stop working on specific pitch situations? And if he's been throwing a lot of walks, is he only working on command? Or when he has no command, does he not work on command? Because we'll tell the pitchers what we want them to work on after each start, especially young pitchers. There are adjustments. You meet your pitching coach. You look at a video of your game. You look at each at bat. You look at the approach you made to the player who you are facing. You do all those things. And it's your job. It's your job to make an adjustment. And we're going to help you do it. And if you can't make an adjustment and a bunch of starts go by and you've lost your command, something that you had in the minor leagues, you've lost your release point, whatever the case is, we're going to send you back down. So we're looking at these signs. The worst thing that happens is when you don't need a sign because it is so obviously in front of you. Well, what happened to Wesker? He got taken out of a game because he gave up a bunch of runs. This is a guy who we picked recently who's had in, in a game, and I don't think we won the pick, but I can't remember, but... He has been pitching phenomenally well when the Braves have been struggling in their rotation. He's been picking up the slack with Soroka, Salah with the Achilles, with Freed with the high ERA. Basically, their pitching rotation is in shambles, and you know it's been great. So he gets pulled out of the game, and wouldn't you know what he did? I kid you not. He went full A.J. Ramos. Yeah, I've told the A.J. Ramos story before when A.J. Ramos got pulled out of the game and he hit the dugout with his pitching hand and he ended up hurting his pitching hand and it impacted his pitching, really impacted it. And when I asked him what he did, he didn't he didn't uh, tell me the truth because I didn't see it. But then, of course, we found out exactly what it was. And then A.J. told me the truth and we had a not so pleasant conversation, which ended with a drink, which was fine. But he had been established as a leader of our team, not a first year player. So, you know, he gets taken out, frustrated, gives up five runs in a loss to the Brewers, hits the dugout, and then all of a sudden he's on the team plane. He has no choice but to go to his trainer and say, you know, my hand hurts a little bit. I think I heard it lifting the suitcase. I think I heard it getting on the plane. I think the bathroom door got jammed. I think when I was flipping cards over or pouring a drink, I think something happened to my hand. No, that's not what happened. Brian Snicker, the manager of the Braves, had already seen him hit his hand upon being taken out of the game. He then found out that it was sore during the flight, bothering him more. They got him x-rays the next day, and guess what? His hand is fractured. So Brian Snicker, their manager, gave a quote yesterday. They checked this morning, and it was a fracture. It's a shame. I'm upset with Atlanta for allowing Brian Snicker to make the comment on that. And then to say it's a shame, because that's not a shame, folks. It's a shame when you're lifting your child to get up the stairs to change their diaper and something happens to your back as you're walking up the stairs. It's a shame when you slip down the stairs carrying your luggage downstairs to a road trip. It's a shame when you have your hand in the door as you're maneuvering yourself into a bathroom and someone closes the door and then your finger gets caught. Yeah, that's a shame. Obviously, you don't want to put your fingers in that position, but you did. That's a shame. It's a shame that he had to be a pinch runner because we had no one left on the bench, and all of a sudden it was a gapper, and he had to go first to third, and he came up a little lame on his hamstring. It is a shame that we do not have the DH here, and he got hit by a pitch and has a contusion on his thigh, and he's, he's going to miss his next start. I can keep going, folks. I'll give you 50 shames of gray. What I won't ever give you is a pitcher or a position player who hurts himself that causes himself to be taken out of the lineup because of how he reacted to not good performance. That's not 50 shades of gray. That's not 50 shams of gray. That is black and white. That's full Michael Jackson. There is nothing positive about that. As a matter of fact, it would make me crazy. And what I do is call up the commissioner's office and find out whether or not we can suspend him and not pay him while he's injured. I've never won any of those, but I've called every time. Part of the game, I'm told, and we'd meet the players 
during the season, before the season, different points of the season, after wins, after losses, after we see some players doing things they shouldn't do when they have a bad at bat or a bad pitching game and say, guys, this is your career. This is our team. Do you ever see a painter, a right-handed painter, hit a wall when he's unhappy with his canvas? Well, you as a righty pitcher are a right-handed painter. An old player of ours, his name is Will Oman, follows on Twitter, listens to the show. He said it sometimes can't be helped. (laughs) Nope, that's not good enough. Yes, it can be helped. It's called mental discipline. Please have it. There's enough problems in baseball with injuries that are not self-inflicted. Have you been reading? The injuries are everywhere. Are you a Yankee fan? You like that Hicks and Stanton are on the DL? Stanton with a quad strain. Hicks with some sort of hand issue that Mark Teixeira said could require surgery, could not because he had the same thing. How about if you're an Angels guy or a woman and you see Mike Trout leave the game with your calf strain? running the bases. There are so many ways. Here's a funny, funny line from a movie, Coca, and for a dollar, Mortimer, I can't tell you which one. It could be Grand Canyon written by Lawrence Kasdan. The line is, there's so many ways to bite it in this world. And there are. Why would you do something to increase the chances of being bit in? It makes no sense. I'm acting all cool about it right now because I don't run a team. I don't run the Yankees. I don't run the Braves. If I did, you want to know what I discipline him? You're damn right I would. Not only would I sit him down and discipline him like a parent, I'd have the manager do it. Then I would have the general manager do it. Then I would have me do it. Because part of our job as parents, and I sometimes you feel, at least later in my career, as you, funny thing, um, Running a baseball team is a lot like being a professor, where when you're a young professor, I was a young executive. I was 31 when I took over the Expos. Very often, there were players on the team older than I was. And as the years passed, I got older every year, and it seemed like the players always stayed the same age. It's how I imagine professors look at college classes. Everybody's the same age every year. You just keep getting older. So eventually the role goes from them looking at you as a peer, sometimes even worse than a peer. Eventually you gain and build the respect as they look to you as an elder. And then one day you look in the mirror and you realize they look to you as a damn grandpa, an out of touch grandpa. So I'm just having the talk and I've had it during the course of my career. Actually, as a peer, you just talk differently. When I was a younger president, the way I would talk to players would be much more jocular. I wouldn't be very serious or stern with them. I would try to get consensus. I'd try to get buy-in because I was young. I would try to get them to say, wow, I totally see that. And it was hard to do. It happened from time to time, but more often than not, it wouldn't. But then as I got older, I really stopped giving a crap whether how they would react to what I was saying because I'd earned the right through experience to say what I wanted and to get it out there in a far more crisp, direct manner. Because as you learn, often when you are disciplining someone, if you're not clear about what you're using to discipline, and I don't mean a paddle, about the reason you're using and the words you're using, there's not going to be growth. And when you've got a pitcher who you are counting on who breaks his hand because he hit a dugout wall and now can't pitch for you, it is not easy to not be stern and direct and have there be consequences. It's like when you're training children. If there are no consequences to actions, what will inform their behavior going forward? I just would like you to think about that. As a matter of fact, the movie that we're gonna review today when we go to break, after we go to break, is exactly about this concept, which is how do you help children in a circumstance where there aren't adults. So I got to wait to see for all these injuries. It's really, is anyone else annoyed by the injuries the way I am? The reason I'm annoyed by the injuries in baseball is that having me say I told you so just doesn't feel like enough. 
we have been warning you and warning teams and warning GMs and warning the media through our show and through my conversations with people that there are going to be more injuries than ever this year. They're trying to make the story about Otani. There's no doubt about it. He is the story of baseball so far, but you can't have the story of baseball on a, on a last place team or second to last place team. It's just not going to happen. He's been great. No doubt. But the stories have just been about injuries. I could say the stories are about the twins who stink. We'll get to that with my pick of the loser pick of the day. But the real story are these injuries. And then fans say, why? Why my guys? And then I say as a president, it's because at all of your players, all of your guys, they wanted a longest season as possible. They wouldn't delay the season. They were not willing to take more time off last year before the restart. All of these things were going to add up. And we told you there were going to be these injuries. Yeah, but David, it's Stanton. Stanton's always injured. No. It is his fourth IL stint since joining the Yankees. I'm going to do a wait to see. Wait to see is when I say something's going to happen and it's not. I have a few wait to sees that I have to tell you tomorrow aren't going to happen. I'll give you a preview of one of them. The Pelicans are not in the playoffs. Darn it. Wait to see. Giancarlo Stanton will not go on the IL again after this trip. This will be his final trip to the IL this season. He may miss games but he will not go to the injured list. And you are going to say, David, you are going to ruin your streak of a wait to see. You've got a wait to see that is guaranteed to be a loser. And I'm going to say to you, hold on. I know exactly what I'm doing here. Do I have any inside information? Wait to see. Giancarlo Stanton back on the IL last trip this season. You can book it. We come back. We're going to review a new movie that was worth $20. And then we are going to talk about God, we got a lot left to talk about. We got to go through the picks because I hate losing and the NBA play in games. They start tonight and you bet you're going to be watching. We will be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. You made it through the gauntlet. Thank you. I'm David Sampson. Every day. We were going to miss a bunch of shows during this road trip because of time or because of driving or because of exhaustion. We just we're addicted to you. We are addicted to your to this, to you, to providing you 45 minutes every day. There will be some days off, I promise. Coca told me that other podcasters and other shows take days off. Other five-day-a-week shows do take days off. I'm not aware of that, only because, to me, I feel like when we don't do a show, that I miss it, and then people contact me that they miss it, so I feel like I'm not being helpful, or that there's not a nugget in there that could maybe help someone throughout the course of their day, learn something, be entertained, and then I take it as my fault. So I went out to dinner last night, and I got back from dinner, and I had been in violation of one of my principles, and one of my principles is I watch a movie every day, and I had not gotten to one. Yesterday was a busy day, seeing people and doing things, had to watch a movie. And I knew that we were recording early today because I have a, another full day here before I leave today. And I had to do it, Coca. So I was up super late and I decided I had to watch something that would keep me awake because I had to watch something and I was in the mood to review what I watched. So I went on Amazon and for $19.99, I rented a movie called Voyagers. Voyagers stars Colin Farrell. I didn't watch the trailer. I had no idea what it was about. It looked to be, to me, like some sort of space movie. Well, let me tell you about Voyagers, the movie, for a minute. It takes place in like 2063 when the planet is becomes uninhabitable. And so what they decide to do is they decide to take a group of people and move them to a new planet. The only problem is the new planet is 86 years away. That's how long it's going to take. So they build a ship and they say, on this ship, we're putting kids. The kids are going to grow up and procreate and then have kids. Those great kids are going to procreate and have kids. So the grandkids of the original people are going to be the ones who colonize this new planet so our species can continue. All right, I've sort of heard that one before. Seems fine. What's Colin Farrell going to do? Oh, he's like the papa from, from uh, Annie, the head of, the head of the kids like the scientists who created them. No, that's not. He wasn't a scientist. He didn't create them. He was in charge of being on the ship and making sure the kids did what they were supposed to do, like take care of the ship. It reminds me a little of passengers. They had to grow their own food. Reminds me a little bit of the Martian. They had to figure out how to stay long-term, knowing that they were never going to go back. 
The difference is these kids were bred, if you will. It felt like a chicken farm where some chickens are just bred to get their heads cut off and you eat chicken. If you don't like what happens to animals who are being bred to be food for human beings, then you become some sort of vegetarian. These human beings were bred in a test tube to be a, a scholar, to be an athlete, all the things that a society needs, to be an engineer, sort of reminded me of the, uh, of the uh, Gerard Butler movie that I just watched where because he got a special dispensation, there was a comet coming to kill the world. He got a dispensation to leave because he was an engineer. Greenland was the name of that movie. I don't know if we ever reviewed that here or on Levitard, but Voyagers is way better. Because what do you think happens when you put a bunch of kids on an 86-year journey and they've been genetically manufactured to be dull and get their work done and have no emotion? You then find out why they have no emotion, and then they find out why they have no emotion, and then they change that, and then they start getting emotion. Do you know what happens when you have emotion? Lord of the Flies. If you have not read the book Lord of the Flies, I encourage you to please read it. There are characters in Voyagers that parallel very well the characters in Lord of the Flies. The moral of the story of Voyagers and Lord of the Flies is while we're all trying to do something for the greater good, when societies are created and you let people be who they are, you are going to have good people. You're going to have bad people. You're going to have situations where groups of people have to work together, and sometimes they can and sometimes they can't. I tried as hard as I could to not like Voyagers, but it didn't work. It was a fascinating case study, and I was blown away that Johnny Depp's daughter stars in the movie. Her father's gotten a lot of bad press, been in a lot of courtrooms. I feel for her. Her name is Lily Rose Depp. She was born when I was old enough to remember. Her mother is, uh, she's French. I want to say Vanessa Marcille, but I think I have that wrong. I think that's the one from Beverly Hills 90210 or Melrose Place. It must be Vanessa Paradis. Paradis, Coca, thank you is the mother of Lily Rose Depp. I had not seen her in anything before. She's worth watching. The whole movie's good. I know some of you don't like spending $20, but please do, just to see what you would be like in a community when you're stuck in a small place for 86 years, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, I'm sort of attracted to him or her or them. I've never had that before. I sort of want to have fun. What does that feel like? Never had that before. I guess someone needs to be in charge. How do we do that? Hmm. Voyagers. Check it out. Okay. I have an update for you. It's a pretty good update. Remember Bob Baffert? We've spoken about Bob Baffert before, right? Bob Baffert is the trainer for Medina Spirit that was doing drugs, got caught doing drugs after winning the Kentucky Derby. And now they're doing a whole investigation. And if Medina Spirit ends up actually being found guilty of having too much, too many drugs in his system, too many picograms of something, then Mandaloon's going to win the Derby. Except if you bet on Mandaloon, you're not going to get your money. And if you bet on Medina Spirit, you're not going to lose your money. Fine. He then was allowed to go to the Preakness, which is a no win situation because if that's the second leg of the Triple Crown, Medina Spirit goes into the Preakness and finishes on the podium, gets the bronze passed all his drug tests. There were extra drug tests, they said. That always made me laugh. We're going to do extra drug tests. We're going to put a needle in every hoof. In your hind legs, too. Guess what? He finished in third place. I guess he needed drugs to finish first. Or didn't he? That's the question we're all asking, Bob. That's why horse racing is in such a cluster right now. So New York has the Belmont Stakes, third leg of the Triple Crown coming up. New York is a major racing association. You've got... Belmont, Aqueduct, Saratoga, if you're here. There's a bunch of places. Guess what they just announced? Update, Bob Baffert and all of your horses. See you later. Bob Baffert will not be allowed to stable any horses at Belmont Park, Aqueduct Race Truck, or Saratoga Race Course, or run any of his horses at the New York Racing Association's tracks. Wait till I tell you the quote. So the New York Racing Association had a quote. In order to maintain a successful thoroughbred racing industry in New York, we must protect the integrity of the sport for our fans, the betting public, and racing participants. The responsibility demands that the action taken today in the best interests of thoroughbred racing. Because, of course, Baffert's had five violations 
in the last 13 months giving the wrong levels of medication, claiming, oh, I had no idea. I had no idea. It was somebody else. All these picograms. Five in the last 13 months. We're talking about a guy who's the face of racing. It's a disgrace. It's about time the New York Racing Association did something. You know what Baffert's lawyer said? We're not going to comment. We're going to think about our comment, and then we're going to respond. We got a lot to say. Well, I got an update. I know exactly what you're going to say. Let me give you your comment for you, Bobby boy. Tell your lawyer this is what you want to say. I'd like to thank the New York Racing Association for their decision to temporarily not allow me to stable horses while we figure out what can be done to make our sport better. I want to figure out how 21 Nico grams could end up in my horse when I only expected 14. I want to find out why the success of my horses when they follow every single rule and regulation and pass every single drug test is still coming into question because of what happened to the horse in Kentucky that I had no idea about. I'm going to keep lying to you in this monotone and tell you that as the trainer, there's a lot of stuff that happens with doctors where I'm not even aware. I can't even imagine that I wouldn't know 14 to 21 picograms. What do I look like? A chemistry teacher? I don't carry a scale. My name is Bob Baffert, and I'm the greatest there ever was, and don't you forget it. And by racing and every association keeping me out of the stable, you're hurting yourselves. People bet on horse racing because of me. People attend the Triple Crown races because of my horses. Bob, Bob, this is your lawyer. That wasn't in the prepared statement. I don't think you should be doing that. Cut out that last paragraph. Do you mind? See where I'm going there, guys? Do you see where I'm going? Bob Baffert's got a problem. He's got an ego problem that's not going to allow him to ever come clean. Double entendre. He's got a problem that's not going to ever allow him to do a statement where he's willing to acknowledge that he does know what picograms are, that he knows exactly what happened to all the other horses, and that he is not the victim of some sort of racing association witch hunt. You going to bet the Belmont? You going to watch it? You're damn right you are. That's not our pick of the day. Did anybody watch the Twins yesterday? That was our pick. We were 66 and 43. I had the Twins going against the White Sox, beginning of a three-game series, critical. Twins in last place, White Sox in first. I said to you, the Twins have to win this game, and they're going to. The Twins got their ass kicked. It was a blowout from the beginning. I was got a Twitter DM from someone who said, when are you going to stop believing in the twins? They break my, my heart every day. Aren't, haven't you had enough? Well, you've heard it here first, folks. And I am going to stick to it. The Minnesota twins will never be my pick of the day for the rest of this season. I don't care if they win 50 in a row. Wait to see. It's a double wait to see, Coca. I will never lose with the twins again because I'm never going to choose them. We're 66 and 44. I'm done with the Twins. It's one of those years I thought they had a chance. They are so far back. They are so unable to hit and to pitch. They forget catching the White Sox. I'm not sure they're going to get out of last place. Playoffs? Playoffs? 66 and 44 is still good, but I hate losing. All right, the NBA playing games are tonight in the Eastern Conference. I'm pretty excited. I'm a little annoyed that I have to stay up till one in the morning tomorrow night to watch the Lakers Warriors, but you know, I'm going to do it. What time are the games tonight, Coca? I got two to watch. The Pacers are playing the Charlotte Hornets with Michael Jordan. And then the Wizards are playing the Celtics. These are playing games. Here's how it works. Celtics play the Wizards. The winner of that game, you're the number seven seed. Congratulations. The loser of that game gets to play the winner of the Pacers Hornets game. Because if you lose the Pacers-Hornets game, that loser, guess what? They're out of the playoffs. So the first game is Pacers-Charlotte. What's going to be interesting about that is the Pacers are minus three over Charlotte. If you win that game, you're not in. If you lose that game, you're out. So by 9 o'clock tonight, all the excitement of Michael Jordan and Charlotte and how great it is to be in the playoffs because they're saying they're in the playoffs, even though they're not in the playoffs, they're only in the play-in tournament to get into the playoffs. It ends tonight for the Charlotte Hornets. We got the Pacers minus three. The Pacers are a much hotter team and a much better team, and they're only given a field goal. 
I got a tougher one at the nine o'clock game. This is the win and you're in game. This is the lose and we're still okay. We just have to beat the Pacers. Celtics are minus two over the Wizards. Celtics, as you know, had that injury they're dealing with. I believe Jalen Brown is out for the year. They've got Russell Westbrook, and I've got to wait to see from December 3rd, 2020. Way back, December 3rd, my wait to see was that the Wizards will not make the playoffs. So how can I have that wait to see and then this pick, Wizards plus two over the Celtics? I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. If the Celtics win by one point, we still cover, we win the bet, and the wait to see is still available. I guess that would be ideal. I'm really hoping for the Wizards to win by a point. What are the odds of that? The reason I'm going with the Wizards is I'm willing to say my wait to see from December was wrong if the Wizards do win. And if the Wizards lose, and then they lose again to the Pacers, then my wait to see ends up being correct because the Wizards don't make the playoffs. This is called the win-win. But I take seriously my pick of the day. When I see the Celtics two over the Wizards, a home team, I believe this game is in, uh, where is this game, Coca? I'm really hoping I know where it is. Is it in Boston? Because if it is in Boston, a home team like the Celtics giving two to a team like the Wizards who just have Westbrook. I guess you could say they have more, but anyway, we're taking the Wizards plus two and we're hoping that the Celtics win by one. (laughs) It's okay if the Wizards win. Okay. Nothing personal pick of the day. We got two picks for you. All right, I want to end with something that uh, you hear me on Nothing Personal talk about when things happen on the field that bother me, when things happen in the front office that bother me. I want to give you my perspective of having been there. When I was with the Marlins, we had a player named Scott Cousins. Scott Cousins, you may not remember, he never really had much of a career. What he's most famous for is he took out Buster Posey on a play at the plate, and Buster Posey was out for the year after that. I believe he was out for the year. It was a very huge deal. Scott Cousins got death threats. Scott Cousins was uh, hated by fans in the Bay Area. And when we would talk to Scott, we would say that was not a dirty play at all. That was one of the things that led to the change of rule where now you cannot run into the catcher, where the catchers are way more protected. A lot of that started with the Scott Cousins Buster Posey play. Now, don't ask me what year it is because I'm just thinking about this now. I didn't realize we were going to talk about this. Uh, Because I didn't think of it while we were preparing for the show. It was in 2011. Thank you, Coca. God, that's 10 years ago. Anyway, you can GTS. Google that shit. That Scott Cousins ran into Buster Posey. Buster Posey gets hurt. And he becomes, his head starts getting hunted. Now go to a few years later, Manny Machado. A far more accomplished player than Scott Cousins. A far more important player than Scott Cousins. He slides into Dustin Pedroia. And Dustin Pedroia's career basically ends. And the thought is it was a hard slide. It was an illegal slide. What is Machado doing? He's a bad guy. I hope you remember when that happened. It was before nothing personal. But boy, we would have covered it significantly. It got a lot of attention. My response to Machado would have been, that's a clean play. It may look dirty, but that's a clean play. Well, the other day, Manny Machado did the same sort of slide that he did with Pedroia, but a little different different than when Scott Cousins did. Here, let me give you the circumstance against the Cardinals. So the the Cardinals are uh, in the field. Tommy Pham is playing second base, normally where second basemen play. There is a man on first base. His name is Manny Machado. Ground ball gets hit. Manny Machado starts running to second, which you have to do. Manny Machado sees Tommy Pham get the ground ball, not near the bag. He's halfway between first and second. Check the highlight if you want, if you don't believe me. And Manny Machado goes into a slide with the bag nowhere near him. And he goes into a slide right so he can take out Tommy Pham and not give Tommy Pham a chance to throw to first and get the double play. Everyone's losing their minds. Manny Machado, you dirty player. You know what Manny Machado did? He made the right play to save a double play. He made the right play to give himself up. Was it, did I say Tommy Pham and it was Tommy Edmond? Why is Tommy Pham in my head? That's what happens when you've been in baseball too long. Thank you, Coco, for correcting me on that. Go check it. It was Tommy Edmond. In any case, that's not the point. Right now, baseball is making it so soft. They don't want any collisions. They don't want anyone to get hurt. They want to make sure no one gets a concussion. They want to make sure no one hurts their ankle or hurts their hamstring. So the hard baseball that was the really the highlight of the beginning of my career, where how bad do you want it? 
You want to win? You want to win? If you want to win, you play hard. If you want to play hard, you play within the rules, but you take it right to the edge. Are you supposed to slide into second base? That's true, but the rule says you can't slide outside the base path to take out a player. Manny Machado slid exactly in the base path between first and second base. It's a moronic play because he's never going to be safe because he's nowhere near a bag. But it didn't matter. He was out anyway. He was trying to make sure that only one out was gotten by the defensive team, not two. But everyone's reaction is that we've raised a bunch of players now who are wussies, executives, team executives, people in the commissioner's office. We can't have anyone get hurt. They're getting hurt too much anyway. We don't want to cause injuries. Do you know what happens when you play not to get hurt? It's like going skiing not to get hurt. It's like playing tackle football not to get hurt like in a pro bowl game. That's when you get hurt the most. Do you want good business in baseball? You got to let players play because they will know how to play right and you'll know when it's wrong and when it's wrong, then you can suspend, then you can fine. But don't make it so Manny Machado has to worry about you thinking that it's dirty when he made a good baseball play. That's the wrong play. That's bad business. This is nothing personal.